I'm Joanne Bundy, and the Planning Committee and I welcome you to the Bucket Courses this morning. This is Mike's last class of his four-class course on Science and Society. And before we get at it, I have a couple announcements to make to you. You will either have a yellow or a pink half sheet of paper on your tables, and that is for uh, uh, your suggestions, comments, evaluations for the bucket courses in general, uh, for this course in particular. The planning committee pays a great deal of attention to your comments because we want to make the bucket courses the best they can possibly be, and you are a big help to that. Secondly, we have Elijah Holden here this morning who has an announcement to make about a survey she's doing. Elijah. I'm a senior at Grinnell College and I'm working on a study of ways to make local food more affordable and accessible in the Grinnell community. Um, so as part of that, I'm looking at food hubs as a way to kind of connect producers and consumers and provide resources um, to community members who might not have access um, to education or affordable food. So I've created a survey and I'm trying to get some community feedback both on the problems and potential solutions. Um, it's about a 10 minute survey, so if any of you would be willing to fill that out either during a break or afterward, I would greatly appreciate your feedback. And there's a consent form um, that goes with that that just basically says that your identity is protected. Um, so I'll have a stack of those on the table outside the room. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, two weeks from today, Dr. J.R. Paulson begins his four-week course on emotional well-being from depression to happiness. I regret to tell you that the, the course is totally sold out at this point. Um, if you have not registered, uh, you can uh, tell your friends or you yourself that the uh, uh, class can be seen on Get12 or you can borrow the DVD from the library, or you can even purchase a DVD from Jack Gustafson. He's the man behind the camera this morning. So you won't miss out completely, but I know you will enjoy being here if you've registered. And JR has been kind enough to drop by this morning and give us a little preview of what his course will be about. Dr. JR Paulson. Joanne, can you hear me in the back? Good. Thanks, Judy. Um, in the late 1700s, Ben Franklin was taking trips back and forth from England to the United States. And uh, he noticed that the trip going one way versus the other way was quite different, irregardless of the winds and the rotation of the earth. And you could go over to England a lot faster than you could come back. Well, Franklin, being a scientist that he is, tries to figure out why and what's going on here, and eventually we come up with the Gulf Stream. Uh, so there was a problem, something didn't fit. Why, why is this happening? Asking the basic science question. Uh, well, the basic science question that I had to ask that leads in back into Mike's lecture here is, in uh, medicine, I see a lot of people who are depressed. Uh, more and more and more. How many of the college students are on uh, antidepressant medicines when I see them, but it's a lot. I see a lot of younger generation, uh, now that I'm older, everything is younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> Wayward, not finding their way, looking for happiness in all the wrong places, and uh, a real problem. Well, when I looked at our medical model, what Dave Ferguson and I are taught in medical schools, the biochemical, we have this scientific model. And getting, as Mike has talked to you, the model you use in science is based on authority, it's based on what's going on in society, it may have religious implications, all of the above. It's not in some isolated theory that they come up with this. Well, I found in my class is going to be that the model for depression and happiness is not a regular model. It doesn't the data doesn't fit, things don't happen, doesn't make good predictions. 
And so as a class, we're going to, the first uh, class, talk about emotional fitness and depression and happiness. And we're going to basically, over the sessions, come up with our own new model. It's JR's um, model, but it's, it's going to be eclectic because it involves scientific fact, not just touchy-feely stuff that's in the real world, real scientific data, but also we have to get into sociologic background of depression and happiness. We have to get into psychological of depression and happiness, any religious and spiritual definitions of depression and happiness. So Mike is really a good lead-in for this because uh, we're going to use the same principles that he's talking about here, but we're going to take a look at happiness and depression through the same lens. So that's, hopefully you, you won't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hopefully we'll come out happy. <laughs> well, now you know why we're sold out. That's <laughs> two weeks from today. And this morning, uh, we have Mike Gunther to complete his course on science and society from Newton to Darwin. Yeah, right. Yeah, Newton to Darwin. Mike Gunther. Thank you. So, I want happiness too. <laughs> uh, and what are we going to talk about today is some, in some ways what makes scientists happy sometimes, which is visualizing things. And so the title of today's lecture, the subtitle especially The Art of Investigation. I think one of the things that surprised me when I would do research into different scientists is how much they like to draw, how much visual thinking goes into the way they try to understand nature, and how much over the centuries they've struggled to make be invisible, visible. So that they can think about it, they can draw it, they can analyze it. Um, and so I start with an image that captivated my attention when I was in um, grade school. How many of you in the, the drawing, the, the first yeah. one? Maybe you've seen this, the kind of iron filing with the magnet. I don't know why, but this just made such an impression on me when I was um, a student. Because here you see not only something that's invisible, made visible to your eyes, but the beauty of the pattern behind it, the way that, and again, it'd be even better if I could do this live and you could see the filings organize themselves. There's just something magical almost about watching um, them organize themselves. And you can even do it in three-dimensional, sometimes with magnets, you can get the filings to stand up, or they have now beautiful kind of um, like bubble chambers where they put filings in a liquid, and then you can put magnets inside of the chamber and you can watch them swirl in three dimension and form different patterns here. Um, so, yeah, I should, yeah, yeah, if you don't mind, lights up, would be great. Um, so this is something that captivated me, and like I said, as I would do research into different scientists over the course of this, kind of the golden age of, of science and modern science from the 1600s to the 1900s, I found that something like this happened in a lot of different fields, where someone figured out, well, today we'll be talking about everything from medicine to um, revealing the patterns of acoustic vibrations to studying all kinds of topics. There were these important moments in which people were able to visualize, to imagine, to draw, to think about the natural world in ways that were kind of startling, exciting, and engaging. Um, and so I think this is an important part, maybe more than even experimentation or mathematics or classification. This is an important part of science we don't often think about. So that's why I wanted to end the series of lectures today talking about visualization. So let me talk about, you know, almost every one of these lectures, I've gone back to the 16th century to identify some set of people or topics that were the beginning of this story, whether it was Boyle with experimentation, or Bacon, or um, I talked about Huygens and mathematics, or Linnaeus and classification. So today I wanted to start with Robert Hooke, um, someone who really exploded the visual imagination of the 17th century. Um, he did that with this book called Micrographia. Um, here. Now, one of the things I find interesting about Hooke is that even though he was this amazing artist, an amazing polymath, um, he actually came up with the inverse square law of gravitation. Newton did the mathematics, but the actual idea that gravitation is, the pull of it is inverse to the distance. A lot of the, the things that are, were important breakthroughs in science he came up with, but he's hardly ever remembered today, and we don't even have an image of it, which I find striking. They said in the late 17th century and early 18th century that Newton had his portrait destroyed because he and Newton were in this kind of epic rivalry with each other. Um, but, so I, I just find it interesting. He also, he worked with Christopher Wren. He did a lot of the building of London. 
he was kind of Christopher Wren's right hand man. So we think about 65 churches were designed and built by Robert Hook. Um, so he was a figure who had his hand in almost every pot kind of in London in the 17th century. But so all I had to show you the image is a, a, a drawing done or painting done in the 19th century to imagine what Hook looked like. But one of the things that Hook was most famous for in his time, besides building, um, was that uh, he had produced this book, Micrographia. And he was the first person to make the microscope available and accessible to the public through beautiful engravings. Um, and if any of you have looked at a microscope, sometimes it's not as easy to see as the patterns of those magnetic filings. Like a microscope takes training, and sometimes the image can be blurry. Sometimes it can be amazing, and sometimes it can be difficult. And so he had to struggle to develop a lot of techniques he, um, to be able to make microscope images clear, engaging, to reveal a world that no one had seen before. And so he developed this technique of using a giant glass that he would fill, so it would be this big convex source of light he would fill with an like, ether um, and use light to project it then through another lens. And so he did interesting techniques to try to get um, as much magnification as he could, because the lenses were not great at the time. But let me just show you some of the slides. And this is what people in the 17th century uh, just couldn't get enough of. In fact, one of my favorite stories about Hooke's Micrographia is that Samuel Pepys, who was this famous diarist and figure, he bought a copy in the bookstore and he, in, he wrote a letter to Hooke and kind of complained that, you know, I wasn't able to sleep for three nights because I just <laughs> stayed up. It's kind of like kids today with Harry Potter. And all that. But people couldn't put it down. Uh, Christopher Huygens, the Dutch mathematician that I talked about a couple weeks ago, he had a similar reaction, just could not put the book down. People were captivated by the imagery. And I do want to emphasize, it takes a lot of visual skill and art to be able to portray what he was seeing, in sometimes blurry ways, or every time he would shift the light, it would look different. So it takes a lot of skill to be able to stabilize it to create these arresting images. So one is of a fly's eye here. Um, the other is of, uh, this is of a cork tree, but he was looking at pieces, slivers of the tree through a microscope. Um, interestingly enough, Hook is the person who coined the term cell to refer to the structure within plants. He would be looking at books of monastic blueprints, and he was thinking about the monk's cells, how they were kind of arranged in these very straight patterns. And so he introduces that term, but also introduces the whole imagery of it. He kind of takes people, as Huygen says, he took me on a journey into an invisible world I knew not existed or knew how to enter. Um, we have some other images. Here's one of him looking at fossils um, inside. And uh, hopefully, maybe you can see these kind of well. It takes a, a lot of skill to do the engraving, and they were beautiful images. Uh, this one is of a leaf. This one is of mold. And this one is of a cambric fabric of his shirt here. And so the book was produced as a folio, which meant it was the largest book printed at the time. It would have been about this big. And my favorite image of it, because most of these were big foldouts. So these were giant copper plate engravings. And this one is of a fleet that he did. I mean, um, and you can see it here. You get a little bit more feel what it would have been like, why someone like Peeps or Huggins would have stayed up all night. They'd be folding out these images here and looking, sometimes horrified by things like this. Sometimes amazed by his um, images of snowflakes, crystals, um, and other things that were not even really able to be seen by the eye. So it was this kind of a visual tour de force. Um, obviously, the telescope, there were a lot of visual implements that were important to the development of modern science here. But I think this was a really key moment um, and it created kind of a craze for people to buy microscopes, um, also to buy telescopes and other kind of devices, um, and to start thinking about um, yeah, what is the structure of nature look like when you're able to see it up close and to kind of see things that you haven't seen. Um, now, obviously, I want to talk a little bit about botanical illustrations. And just to kind of, this is one larger strand that you could spend a lot of time talking about, which is art and science, especially in terms of how they interrelate with each other with illustrations. So I want to talk a little bit about botanical illustrations, but I could also just as easily be talking about anatomical illustrations, of like the human body or the bodies of animals, geological illustrations, illustrations in physics. I mean, there are all these different fields where um, the ability to artistically and realistically portray nature is really important to the development of science in terms of communicating to a popular audience, but as I'll try to talk about over the course of the lecture too, in terms of just producing new knowledge. It turns out that 
being able to visualize things is really important to being able to think about them in new ways. Um, what I wanted to talk about with botanical illustrations, uh, especially, is their role in terms of the, about how sci science and society interact, is their role in shaping imperialism um, and in shaping a different kind of human projects uh, in the 17th and 18th century. So, to me, one of the most interesting collections of artistic illustrations in this period is in Madrid, in the Spanish archives. They have about over 10,000 botanical illustrations um, that were all systematically drawn and recorded um, by artists and scientists paid by the government um, of the Spanish crown. You know, so they had set up these special artistic workshops in Peru, in Granada, in Mexico, different places. And the Spanish crown paid for these large and kind of lavish botanical expeditions where people were to go and record all the different specimens. Um, and there was a real economic and even sometimes political purpose behind that. They wanted to know exactly what was growing in their empire. They wanted to know what useful crops, what kinds of medicines and drugs existed. And I think in important ways, like scientists, politicians or, or administrators, they wanted to be able to see their territory, which was really hard when you were thousands of miles away. I mean, you have to think about the fact that in 1600 or 1700, political administrators were trying to govern territories that extended all around the globe in, in ways that they were never able to see them, they were never able to visit them. And so in important ways, art and the, the ability of botanists and other scientists to draw landscapes, to draw different artifacts, mapping, another form of kind of visualizing. Um, these people became really important tools of imperialism um, in important way, ways. And so let me say one thing, though, first about the kind of drawings. I mean, when I look at botanical drawings, I'm just usually drawn to that they're pretty. Right? But they look really nice, and I kind of want my house to have a lot of botanical drawings hanging on the walls here. But as I start to kind of study them and, and see other scholars that study them, there's really interesting kind of scientific knowledge embedded in the style of drawing. So you'll see increasingly over the course of the 17th and 18th century an attempt to use drawings as a form of kind of virtual um, dissecting, like opening up the plant to reveal seed pods, to reveal the structure of the flower. Um, we talked last week a little bit about Linnaeus and the Linnaean system of classification. And so you'll see um, on most flowering plants um, depictions of the pistils, the stamens, all those things that are key to the Linnaeus system. So even if when you look at a flower you can't see those aspects, normally to the eye, they have these exploded views that show those parts of the plants that are key for classification. And, I think it's really important to remember that it's very hard to move plants. Um, you could dry specimens and send them to a herbarium, which was also done, but they retain none of the structure, the color. It's just very hard to, to do much with a dried specimen. They want to see what it looked like in the field, what it looked like at different seasons, where it grew and stuff. And so they turned to these botanical artists. And, and most scientists would have had training in drawing as well. We go back to the previous lecture when I talked about artists engineers and how most people were trained in being able to draw a linear perspective or being able to draw that way. Um, so art became a really important part of the kind of scientific expedition. Um, and here's another image that's in one of those archives in Madrid, which is laying out the ele elevation of the different places in which plants are growing. So they were asking these scientists not only to draw the plants, but to draw them these kind of topographical maps. And it's out of this that we start to get the tradition of like kind of isothermic lines. If you've ever seen a map in which temperature, or if any of you are gardeners, you know, the USDA map, we're in zone four slash five or whatever. These kinds of maps that try to make sense of the landscape um, by creating these new categories and visually drawing with colors, connecting areas that in some ways don't share anything in common. You know, Iowa and I'm trying to think what else is in zone four. Uh, there's other parts of the East Coast, like Iowa and Eastern Pennsylvania don't share a lot in common. But we do in terms of our our temperature or humidity. So these maps rearrange the familiar and kind of draw new connections, kind of literally kind of redraw the boundaries of the landscape here. And so, um, like I said, the, the Spanish crown, but also the British and the French, in general, you see imperialists turning very heavily to science and to, especially the artistic tradition in science, to be able to capture and record and bring back to places like London, Madrid, Paris, a, a really rich visual record of the surroundings. And even today, scientists use these records a lot um, to figure out what was happening um, here. So 
I want to move now a little bit from illustrations to this kind of um, issue that's a little bit deeper, which is what do you really gain when you try to start to draw things, um, try to start to visualize it. I want to use, um, jump ahead a little bit of time and, and think about this, I think an important and kind of famous moment that some of you may have heard of. You might have heard John Snow in this attempt, maybe you haven't, but um, of trying to map cholera. Um, and I want to talk about how, especially in the field of medicine, new techniques of mapping and visualizing became really important. Um, cholera was a disease that was one of the kind of most terrifying killers in the 19th century. Uh, the first cases in Britain didn't arrive until about 1831, so it was kind of a new disease. It was not one that had been endemic in European history. Um, it arrived and made its way um, east from India along different water routes and through Russia. Um, it arrived, like I said, in 1831 in London. Um, it was a terrifying killer because people died usually within a day or two. Um, uh, they, the numbers were, could be staggering in small areas. I mean, I think the overall number is about 100,000 people died of cholera in England. But it was the fact that it would come at one moment, might kill 500,000, 2,000 in a neighborhood. Like I said, the speed, people would wake up one day, start to have um, diarrhea, start to have these kind of symptoms, and then it would be dead an hour later. It's a kind of disease that attacks the intestinal system. You basically, die of dehydration. You just can't keep anything in your water. It just kind of comes out uh, here. And so it was a real challenge to the medical community. It was seen as frightening. People, this image here um, from the magazine, the popular Victorian magazine, Punch, kind of shows um, you know, a court for King Cholera. People understood that there must be some connection to uh, filthy living conditions or bad sanitation, but there was a lot of debate about within that um, between different camps in medicine about what could cause it. The most popular theory was this theory called miasma theory, that people uh, become sick because they breathe noxious or disease-ridden air, which kind of, which they call miasma, and it kind of exudes up from things that are rotting or stinking. It could come from the earth itself, from swamps, things like that, but it also could come from human waste, cesspools, stagnant rivers, things like that. So that was kind of basic ideas, that it's just a kind of noxious fume in the air. It's not necessarily passed from person to person. Uh, they don't have any idea of microbes at this point. Um, it would be Louis Pasteur and others who would be able to show a couple decades later, they would be able to reveal a whole other invisible world, the world of germs and things like that. Um, but out of this moment, for about 15 years, the public was captivated, the scientific community, everyone wanted to explain and understand cholera. Out of that came this really rich visual record of people trying new graphs, new mapping techniques, anything possible to try to understand this kind of silent, um, but terrifying killer. So I'll kind of walk through some of these images. But I find them just really visually interesting to look at and to see how people started to think about I can potentially understand this disease sitting in my room, mapping, plotting, drawing. Um, it's a really kind of interesting approach. So usually the hero of the story um, and the person that kind of receives the most attention is this figure, Dr. John Snow. He was a, um, originally a surgeon apothecary and then becomes a doctor. He works in London. Uh, he's a bit of an outlier in that he thinks that cholera must be waterborne. And he doesn't have a theory to explain why or how the disease he sometimes calls it a poison, sometimes says maybe it's an amicula, some little tiny animal. He doesn't really know what it is, but he just has this hunch from working with patients that it could be water-related. Maybe it's people getting bad water from the Thames. And so at the instigation of some of his friends, and he's a member of one of these new medical societies that were forming in cities where doctors would get together and do experiments or read papers with each other, try to make medicine a very scientific and professional field. So they, they kind of convince him that he should start mapping out uh, the different cases. And so this is from images from a movie that was done in, in Britain about him. Uh, and shows him kind of dramatically putting lines on a paper. This is the map that he created here. It was a map of a particular outbreak around Broad Street in Soho area of uh, London. Um, and he marked one line for each death in a house. And so we started to kind of look at it and figure out, are there visual patterns to the way people die? This was an outbreak in which, over the course of, I believe it was like two weeks, in this one small neighborhood, about 600 people died. Uh, so it was this very kind of devastating, virulent disease. It was also a little surprising because it was not the worst part of London. It wasn't the slums of 
the East End or South London. It was kind of a, a more normal, mixed neighborhood. In fact, mm. um, Snow himself lived in this neighborhood. That's why he decided to do it. So well, we started to map these things out, and one of the things that was interesting is he started to do kind of experiments. He said, well, okay, if I think it's water, then I need to, on the map, start putting, and I'll go back for a second, I need to start um, identifying all the pumps. And so he has little circles for each pump that people could be getting water from. Um, and then he started realizing, well, okay, how do I know whether people use water or not? So he starts out by just kind of drawing a, a radius. He takes a compass, like a drawing compass, and says, this would be a 10-minute walk, and when I talk to people, people don't want to walk over 10 minutes for their water. There's usually a pump there. He starts to do that. Then he starts to create this much more interesting, if irregular, blob shape. This is a line in which he starts to actually walk the city with a stopwatch. It says, how long does it take to walk to the Broad Street Pump? Uh, because one of the things that you've ever been in one of these Byzantine old cities is that there's dead ends, there's different paces and stuff. So sometimes it's much quicker to get from here. It's, you know, you can go from here to the pump at the middle of Broad Street, uh, which is a much longer distance than you can from here. Because in this case, you have to go all the way down and around and stuff like that. So he's figuring out um, something that you know, today modern traffic engineers or others try to figure out, which is what is the real flow at which people move around. And so and he starts really getting to know this area well um, in terms of as he's mapping its human geography uh, and whatnot. And then there's just surprising cases like uh, up here. I see on this map. Let me go back to this bigger map. Right here is a giant workhouse with 500 inmates. And in, in London, the 19th century, workhouses were places where people who were poor were kind of consigned to, physically forced to work in them in order to pay for their own sustenance um, here. So yes, Charles Dickens, right? Exactly, the world of Dickens. But in this workhouse of 500 inmates, there's only five deaths. And that seems very surprising. It's right across the street from these houses that have you know, 30 people dying, 40 people dying. Didn't make a lot of sense. There was also a brewery right here, which had something like 600 workers, and not a single case of cholera. So he's starting to look at this map, and these are the kinds of things that he might not, yeah, drinking beer, right? Uh, not drinking water. Yeah, exactly. The safety of beer. So, and so he starts to ask, and I guess it's kind of hard in some ways to recreate the entire story up here. Um, uh, but part of it is that it's a process where he's visually thinking and, and thinking through this map and starting to ask questions and realizing. Each piece of evidence starts to add more weight to his picture that he's starting to say, which is that I believe at the heart of Broad Street there's a pump right here. I believe that all of these deaths in this radius are directly attributed to that pump, that source of water, not to bad air, which would be spread around um, the whole place. And so then he'd start to even ask people in outlying areas. He'd go to these homes and say, by any chance, did you have anyone who would have used the pump at Broad Street and said, well, sure enough, you know, our daughter that died, she went to school on Broad Street, so she went there every day. Or there was one case way out here, or I can't remember, maybe it's even farther off the map, but the person had grown up on Broad Street and they liked the water taste of the pump, the taste of the water, so they made sure to have their son bring a bottle every week to the house just because they wanted that old taste of what they grew up with. So that helped explain why a, a sickness would occur there. So he starts to amass all this, and he's presenting it to his friends at the um, London Epidemiological Society and other things, and, and presenting what seems like a very compelling case. And these maps are published in the public, and you know, the audiences are quite impressed with the logic here. He doesn't have a theory, again, to explain what is exactly in the water or why it's there, but he's building a very interesting case, and he's encouraging other people to start using maps, start kind of plotting out these kinds of diseases. Um, other people use different theories. I mean, one of the things I think is worth pointing out is that no, for, no technique or tool of knowledge ever produces total consensus, right? Or total truth. Like, it, you know, you can use a powerful tool of knowledge, whether it's math or experiments or classification, and it can still lead to debate. It can still have kind of dissension within it. And so one of the interesting things is people use these same new techniques to propose other theories. So one of these is William Farr, who believes cholera deaths are due to particular weather patterns. And so he creates these beautiful kind of spiral circles in which temperature, barometric pressure, and rain are all put in different colors. And then these black outlines are kind of large <coughs> epidemic deaths here. And he's showing that they only seem to happen during these certain periods. So he's starting to look for these kinds of patterns here. Um, 
And again, these make big impressions on the public. They make big impressions on the scientists. Sometimes they, when they put stuff in graph form, it's just a bunch of numbers. And they're looking at it, it's not easy. Then they put them sometimes with these different visual techniques. And all of a sudden they see startling patterns appear, or connections they never would have thought of. So they see it very much like an experimental lab as a place to think about things, to kind of explore, make new connections here. Um, another popular theme during the time period that created a lot of graphs and charts was this idea that it was topography. So, and this was a, a tied a bit to the miasmic theory, but the idea is the higher elevation you are, the more that you're away from stagnant water, and you're in cool, refreshing air, um, and this was a very popular idea that existed all throughout the U.S. and Europe. Um, you could map often wealth and where people wanted to settle by topography, how high they were up. They're literally, people looked down on others, the lower class, kind of physically. It was an interesting kind of, yeah, topography in the class. Um, and so uh, a, a British physician slash priest, uh, William Auckland, who was in Oxford, he did a lot of really interesting mapping work of topography. <laughs> Um, and this is one of his maps where, or charts where he kind of lines up cholera deaths here and then lines them up with barometric pressure, altitude, um, all the different things. They're all arranged by topography in the chart here. It's one of the things people have to figure out is like how do you, I mean they might have learned when they were school children about plotting things on an axis or about basic kind of plotting, but they had to think about new things. So I plot three dimensional images, or what if I want more than two variables, how would I do that? So this is one of these experiments to kind of take a lot of variables and show a pattern. Um, sometimes the patterns are not easy for us to see. You know, sometimes you have to kind of know a lot about the subject to see things in them. Um, but in his view, this was kind of a slam dunk case that topography mattered much more than actual the source of one. This was another attempt by someone to draw a graph of the number of deaths Along each mark is a, a change of 100 feet in, in height or altitude uh, place. So it shows how it gets very small at the top and you have this wide base at the bottom. So I think this probably a more, makes more visual impact probably to audiences in the sense of seeing literally like the kind of pyramid effect here. But again, uh, all different types of, of techniques of charting, graphing. I brought this one up. This had to do with cholera. I just wanted to make the point that these techniques spill out into other fields in interesting ways. So this was done by Florence Nightingale, um, a lot of you know. And I, I think a lot about her and the Crimean War because the Ukraine, Crimea, and the news all the time. Uh, and so, but Florence Nightingale made this, it was kind of a famous diagram at the time called the Rose Diagram, which was to show that deaths among British soldiers in the Crimean War um, could have been avoided. And so the blue are deaths due to secondary diseases of infection caused by poor sanitary conditions. Uh, red is due to, I think, deaths in battle, and black is due to like, deaths from complications of, um, of wounds or something like that. So you can see that deaths actually caused by battle are kind of far outnumbered. Um, and there was other interesting things she discovered about the particular times of year and the particular diseases here. But again, she and others thought well, there was a lot of value in being able to kind of map these things out onto to graphs. So, um, I wanted to come back, actually, just kind of building these themes. And, and feel free if you have questions uh, to ask me. But when I talked, um, <coughs> I began last class with Luke Howard, if any of you remember about classification and how he developed the taxonomy of clouds that we use today, nebulous, cirrus, cumulus. A lot of these figures have multiple kind of <clears throat> sides to their, pers their scientific personality. One of the things I want to talk about is how Luke Howard also loved drawing and loved visualizing. So he wasn't only about just kind of creating a taxonomy, he also thought it was very helpful to draw. And so he was one of the first people, and this is in the very beginning of the 19th century, to develop all these kinds of bar graphs. He got away from using just line graphs. They got away from using just tables with numerical data, um, which there's a really famous quote once where he said, it just it makes the eyes glaze. <laughs> the, if you read the philosophical transactions or any of these different sources, um, they would just print pages and pages of tables and charts of all the barometric and temperature readings for an area. And he just thought, how would the mind ever be able to understand that? Or how would you be able to see patterns? And so he experimented um, with different methods of using these kind of line graphs to show how temperature variated around the mean. Um, they started to use circle graphs. He thought, this is even much better. I can 
project things in interesting ways. They've tried drawing different lines and curves. Like, what's the best curve to be able to um, predict or capture the fluctuation in temperature? And could we find a scientific law or an equation that would do that? That was his great hope. And so he started out with kind of a circle that I just kind of highlighted in blue to show you because it's a small image, what the mean temperature would be. But then he discovered that if you actually draw a certain kind of ellipse, that it creates a much better predicting aspect of the weather. And then he said, well, is that the same ellipse as the orbit of the sun? I don't know, maybe that's worth looking into it. So he started doing all these things with these different graphs and curves and lines. Um, here's another one with barometric pressure where he's interested in plotting out the rise and fall of barometric pressure over the course of a year. And he created literally dozens and dozens of these different circle graphs. Um, and this one he has kind of, uh, actually, um, let me fast forward to the, to the next slide. Here's a close up of it. But he shows where he has a sinusoidal curve trying to predict, does, it, does the, the fluctuation of the weather follow certain trigonomic equations about sine or cosine, those kinds of things. So he's experimenting with all these things, but he's not doing it so much in terms of mathematics, but he's doing it much more in terms of visualizing. Just he wants to see it on paper, he wants to draw it. He's experimenting, as you see, even with different colors and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I wanted to put up here this quote um, that is at the beginning of this volume on the climate of London. Here he says, I shall have frequent occasion in the course of this volume to present the reader with a series of results expressed by a curve, a mode of speaking to the eye which greatly facilitates the comparison of such variable quantities. Um, and then the quote goes on. But I really love that phrase, a mode of speaking to the eye. I think that captures what Luke Howard and others were really trying to do, which is to, to, to make nature, which is complex, or even data, which is just kind of makes the eyes glaze of all of this, these numbers. <laughs> How do you make it speak to the eyes so that you can kind of understand it uh, in better ways? Um, and I just wanted to kind of point out, I think this is really interesting, to, why did he think in terms of circles and whatnot? Part of it is because one of the things he developed was, and I didn't mention this the other day, but he and others developed a cyanometer, uh, which is a specific way to categorize the color blue for meteorologists. They wanted to know well, how blue is the sky? Because they thought, you know, scientists were telling them that the color of the sky was not accidental. But they had certain physical properties and things, and so they wanted to start recording in their weather books the color of the sky. So that means you have to have a nice classification, right? We all have to agree, how do you define the color blue, right? So they create this thing called a sinometer, and they kind of standardize it. So you say, today, it's shade 26, right, of the color blue. Um, and I mention this just because it, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really little interesting part of this meteorological scheme, but then it gets them thinking in terms of creating these wheels, like, visually, how can I map out not just the color blue, but all data onto these wheels. Um, and so, like I said, he and others, just almost every field of science they look at, there are people experimenting with new forms, um, graphs, charts, um, data, things about making something like the weather, uh, making it appear on paper in ways that you can potentially understand patterns. People actually predict, uh, it gets a little debunked later, but they predict that you can um, develop patterns about wind Wind doesn't apparently fluctuate just randomly, but it obeys certain kind of mathematical curves. Um, What's his baseline right now? The, the baseline here, yeah, that would be the, just the arithmetic mean. So like what is it, you took all the barometric measures um, and then averaged them out. What's the mean over the course of the year? He's also the person that proves that cities actually have higher temperatures than their surrounding areas. Um, he does these careful things and he starts discovering about the artificial heat that cities generate because of the structures and the populations and things like that. So there's a lot of interesting things that Luke Howard goes on to do besides just kind of naming the cloud. So we'll stop here actually um, for our break and when we come back we'll talk about physics, medicine, worlds of kind of graphic drawing, things that happen in those fields. Thank you for taking your chair being quiet <laughs> after that bell ringing. I, I have to uh, take the blame for the cell phone going off this morning and breaking our long time record. I forgot to remind you to turn off your cell phones and to turn on your T coil. So it's really my fault. So we won't, we won't blame Jack Gustafson. <laughs> For the surveys that uh, were passed or are on the table this morning, you can take those home with you if you wish. 
and fill them out, bring them back to the library anytime, or bring them back next week when you come to the bucket courses, and we'll take them at that time as well. So now, the last half of the last class of Mike Gunther. Welcome back, Mike. Okay, thank you. All right, so, so for the remainder of the class, I wanted to talk about uh, the world of physics and physiology. We're going to be kind of focusing a lot on Germany and the continent in the middle decades of the 19th century. So from about 1830 to about 1870 or so. There was what I think you can kind of call a graphic revolution. A kind of effort to see what new techniques of drawing and graphing could do for what are often seen, especially in the case of physics, the hardest of sciences. Right? Physics have experimentation, they have advanced mathematics. What will they really learn from graphing? Is there anything that drawing can do other than just illustrate textbooks? And the answer that people in Germany find out is there's actually a lot of interesting things you can do if you're able to draw in kind of disciplined and interesting way. So we start this story, though, in Scotland and in England at the end of the 18th century with James Watts, the inventor of the steam engine, or the modern steam engine, the condenser and the advanced steam engine. And one of the things that Watts does that's really kind of fascinating that allows him to increase the efficiency of a steam engine by about 40% uh, is that he ends up creating a simple thing, indicator diagram, a steam engine indicator diagram. It's, I say simple, but it, I don't have any pictures of it. Watts was incredibly secretive. He refused to actually file for a patent because he didn't want anyone to see it. Um, there are kind of no, from, to my knowledge, there's not a single existing extant copy of one of his indicator diagrams. So he would take it with him. He would not leave it with someone when he installed the steam engine. But basically, an indicator diagram was a, a clever device in which a pencil is attached to the rod of a piston and then counterbalanced with weights and attached to a hygrometer and a thermometer. And, and I frankly do not understand exactly how it works. Um, but basically, as the piston goes up and down, this pencil moves up and down on a piece of paper. But the device also slides sideways as pressure expands. And so what you're creating is a, a two-dimensional model of pressure, and volume. So on this axis is uh, pressure, and on this axis is volume. So you create this kind of loop, which again, you know, to a layperson, it doesn't look particularly exciting. Why would you hide this device? But actually, what it was being used for is the curve that's being traced out here tells you exactly how much work the engine is doing. Mathematically, if you figure out what is inside this curve, you know the horsepower of the engine, you know its efficiency. Um, I think, yeah, here I have an image of the different strokes. So what's being charted out in one of these indicator diagrams is the different stages of a cycle of an engine. So expression, uh, expansion, compression, combustion, uh, and whatnot. So he developed this device, and so he would look at his indicator. He could tell whether his piston was leaking, leaking whether he needed more pressure. He basically was able to use it as a diagnostic tool. The way that any of us, when we have our car, I mean, you know, first thing that they do when they want to understand a car is they hook it up to a system, a computer, to figure out how it's running. This is the first example of that, a device that graphically shows you how an engine is performing and lets you calculate what it's doing. Um, and so it can be fine-tuned. Well, here's a, a little bit of a later example. And so when they were trained, I, I love there's these collections of railroad companies or anywhere where their engine doesn't want to have these um, indicator cards. It's just kind of the standard part of, the, of an equipment. Um, it meant also that, in, in the, I should say too, that this is how later on there was a French theorist, Carnot, who kind of, he explains all the principles, all the mathematics behind not only a steam engine, but any engine, any kind of heat energy working system. And he does it based on these kinds of diagrams, so he does it kind of visually. So from th this point on, from about the 1820s onward, um, anyone interested in physics, engineering, anyone with a technical background is going to be very familiar with this device. Um, and with its principles, because it helps explain and adjust the most important piece of equipment in the 18th and 19th century, the steam engine. And so what's interesting is how all these people take that basic idea and then apply it to almost anything you can imagine. So the first example I want to talk about is Carl Ludwig and the climograph, which measures, he basically says, isn't the heart really just an engine? Pumping, doing work, pressure, volume, so he starts to create this thing called a climograph where he hooks people up and is able to translate blood pressure being measured um, onto a stylus that is, that is inscribing a line up and down as this drum revolves. You know, any of you that are in hospitals, you see that some version of this in all kinds of equipment, right? Um, the, basic, the basic idea of a rotating drum with a little stylus that marks out some change in 
whether it's blood pressure, pulse, respiration. And they do it as well for respiration. They figure out a way to have people breathe into a <coughs> tube, and then the tube, as it inflates, moves a stylus to measure respiration. And so it was kind of crazy in the 1830s. Let's turn everything into lines on the drum, right? And let's see what happens. Um, let's, let's look at these lines. Um, One of the people that's very interesting in this effect is a person named Hermann Helmholtz, uh, who's whose passions I find really fascinating. He's passionate about physics of energy. He develop, helps develop the law of conservation of energy. He's passionate about music and sight. He develops the modern theories that still hold today about how we hear and how we see. Um, and he's passionate about frog wings. He's passionate about um, muscles and understanding the human, um, well, I should say human, animal anatomy, how muscles move how the human body and the nervous system could be like an engine. So these three things seem so disparate, but they're actually all connected by his kind of graphic techniques. In each field of study, basically what he's doing is he's trying to convert complex phenomenon into lines scribbled on a, on a rotating graph bar, which he then analyzes. Um, and if any of you, for those of you that are interested in kind of mathematics, there's a, a big change that takes place in the early 19th century. I'll, I'll be very brief, but the development of Fourier series development of a mathematic technique which basically says if you have curves that are not regular or uniform, they don't follow. Normally if you have a curve like the curve of acceleration that follows a particular physics law, you know, force equals mass times acceleration or something, and that graph is a representative, it represents an algebraic equation about variables, about force or speed. Right? So what do you do with something like this? This is not a regular, I could draw you know, lines that are seem intensely irregular, the, the lines of pulse or something like that. Um, is there any way you can mathematically analyze those if you can't bring them down to the equation? And Fourier develops this technique of Fourier series which says that basically what you're dealing with in that case is kind of harmonic oscillation. And there are mathematic ways to analyze it. So don't be afraid, I mean I guess the short answer is don't be afraid if you get a weird curve. There is ways that mathematicians now know to understand deep symmetry and deep understanding in the strangest of curves. And so they start producing all these different kind of devices. Here's a person, a human, who's being hooked up to one of these uh, Maya graphs. So they're measuring his muscle. It's very, it's very flattering portrait here. This is supposed to be Hemholtz, kind of. In his, you know, it is a Apollo-like moment. Here. I won't show you. I don't think I have a picture of Hemholtz himself. It's not. It's quite a jarring difference. So he invents this device called the myograph, which basically allows him to hook up, and I have a picture here, to hook up the leg of a frog to, um, to one of these kinds of devices here. And so what he's doing is he gives the frog, um, gives the muscle a shock, uh, and then watches what happens as the muscle moves. Now it normally happens at such a speed that the human eye can't really see what happens. And there's no way to understand it. Physiologists, I mean, you certainly wouldn't think a physicist would be interested in playing with a frog leg, right, or drawing it out. But it turns out that as you do these kind of curves, as you watch the curve made as the muscle expands fully and then contracts. Again, the idea is he's starting to think of it like, maybe what I'm looking at is basically just an engine, like a piston, like Watt's piston going up and down. And can I look at these curves the same way that Watt's looked at his engine diagrams? Can I use them to figure out exactly how much work is being done, um, and then some famous examples that I'll give here. And these curves, yeah, for physicists, these were actually quite famous curves. I kind of knew these here. This is a, the curve of a frog's leg um, as it kind of expands and then contracts here. Um, and then and he was able to prove certain principles about the conservation of energy, which I won't get into, but that even within animals, that the amount of shock given, the amount of chemical transaction, and the work being done all add up to each other. And so that kind of proves this idea of conservation of energy. And it's a dramatic proof. If you could, one thing to prove it on a theoretical engine like Carnot, it's another thing to say, I can show you how a frog's leg embodies the basic principles of the universe, the conservation of energy. And he does it graphically, measuring these different lines. That's impressive to people. They start to take these graphs very seriously, these curves uh, here. Uh, and I should say also that Hemmholtz too was trained as an artist. A lot of these German scientists and stuff, they had training at their gymnasium level in arts and they're very interested in, in Greek and Platonic ideas about the form, that what we see in the world is kind of a, a shadowy representative of a more idealized form. So when they're looking at these curves, they're not so much trying to capture with photographic realism 
an event. They're more thinking like, what is the idealized curve? Like, how am I looking into the into the seams of the universe in some way when I'm doing this? So there's really interesting kind of ways in which an artistic side and a scientific side emerge. And then here's another diagram, which on, again on the surface, all these diagrams don't seem to reveal much. But what he does is he moves the stimulus that he applies to a muscle of a frog different lengths away from the muscle on the leg. And what he discovers is that when you attach that to a myograph, what you do is you can actually figure out the time interval, the difference between when the leg contracts and moves when it's like, say, a centimeter from the muscle versus two centimeters from the muscle. And so he shows that what we're seeing here are two curves <clears throat> happening at the same time in which a leg has been stimulated, a muscle has been stimulated at different distances. And why that's interesting is he's able to prove how long it takes for the nervous system to transmit signals. Because he basically is able to figure out, okay, if it's one centimeter apart, there's this much time difference on my diagram. He shows that uh, the nervous system, and I, I didn't write down the number, but I think it's something like, it moves at the speed of uh, maybe 25 meters a second or something, if anyone moves more accurately. But it's very slow compared to the speed of sound or anything like that. And so he starts, He's the one who first kind of gives us a number and a sense and an explanation for why there's a delay in our reactions. And this changes, it's kind of a game changer in a lot of sciences because all of a sudden people start to realize that um, your reaction when you think you see a star in a telescope is delayed by a certain amount. And so yeah. these things have to be rewoven into the way we observe all things in nature, that there is a delay time. And people get very interested in that kind of science there. Um, let me talk a little bit too. So, so Hemholtz is doing all this interesting stuff with physics, managing the human body as an engine and subjecting it to these different devices so that he has lines and curves to study how it moves and works. He's also interested in doing the same thing with sound uh, here. And so one of the challenges is, and one of the things that they're really excited about is, can you make sound visible? And can you analyze it as curves? And the answer is yes, you can. So there's this person, uh, Lisa Zhu, who develops this technique of creating these highly precise tuning forks. Um, they each have little mirrors on them, and then when they're placed at perpendicular angles with each other, and a light source is made through them, which you're able to see as you strike the tuning fork, is you're able to visually see the waves that are made. The light, as it passes through these mirrors, is being vibrated by the music, by the tuning fork pitch here, um, in ways that let you see the actual shape of the wave. So he has these amazing drawings of people like, for the first time you can see what pitch sounds like, what different sounds are like. So you have these Lisa G curves, and they have applications in a lot of different fields, because again, it's all about this mathematics of, of um, harmonic systems and oscillations. So again, if you're at like a doctor's office or a hospital, sometimes you'll see machines with these kind of sinusoidal waves and these Lisa G waves that are used to diagnose different parts of the heart or things like that. Um, whether it's a tuning fork, a heart, any system that has a kind of rhythm to it, a muscle, a pulse, can be now subjected, can be turned into curves and lines and kind of studied and analyzed. And Hemholtz develops this thing called a vibrational microscope, which is just a much simpler version. Instead of having to like hang your forks out with mirrors and develop that kind of, you know, rather than having to set up this whole workstation, he develops one concise little tiny microscope where, again, you insert whatever fork that you want to see the actual vibration of, um, and then you're able to see the different waves here. So he uses this to actually understand how it is that the ear um, hears and understands the difference of pitch and sound. Um, and again, it, this, these kinds of things get beyond my personal understanding. I'm not a specialist on this field, but it's really interesting that he's able to, it does the same thing with sight, that he's able to develop the theories that we still use today and the understanding of sight and hearing based mostly on these drawings of lines and curves and this, uh, this intense desire to kind of make everything visual for him. Um, he develops the kind of techniques, the same things we use today with color wheels and all, all this really interesting visual things. Um, here. Now the person who brings this to its kind of zenith uh, is this figure, uh, Marais, um, who's a, a Frenchman working in the 1860s. Um, and he writes a book called The Graphic Method. It's basically like, we need to apply this in every field of the human endeavor. We need to turn everything into to lines and graphs. And so um, he develops all these different devices that are basically versions of what we've seen, like a myograph or a climograph or an indicator diagram. Attach some device with you know, nodes and stimuli to a personal. Um, here, here's one where you can run and watch 
the movement that you're running, this, this image here, uh, you can see the different lines that your legs are making as you do this. He did the same thing with a horse. They're really, really fascinating images of a horse that's made to gallop with this contraption. It's tracing out the lines of its muscular movement here. Here's another similar version. This one you can wear at the office. Uh, <laughs> Kind of, uh, and it's actually being used by ergonometrists and people who are studying like office, like trying to be um, tailorites. These people are concerned with efficiency in the office, um, you know, making sure that every movement counts and stuff. The idea is now you have a way of visualizing them. You can, at the end of the day, ask for everyone's personal record and see exactly how it was that they moved and their motions. So, um, he does really interesting things with insects and birds where he attaches them to these different graphic tools. So here's one of a, a pigeon being made to fly, and he's tracing out the movements of the wings. And he realizes that uh, insects flap their wings in a certain helix pattern, uh, and that birds are a slightly different one. But again, seeing the deep beauty and symmetry that's hidden in nature <coughs> here. Uh, I have to say that when I'm in cities now, I look at pigeons a little differently. <laughs> and, uh, the beauty of their wings flapping out these kind of patterns here. Um, uh, and then when photography comes along, you have even more options. But I just want to point out that that basic technique of using a kind of a rotating bar drum, a stylus, making lines, studying the curves, studying the geometry of it, um, that could be used and was used in all kinds of fields. But then when photography comes along, Moray and others kind of seize upon that. And, um, just to think about how expansive these techniques are, he gets really interested in his later life and kind of helping to set up the field of what I guess we consider aerodynamics today. So what he's using is a special kind of smoke machine uh, and fans to blow wind across different shapes. And he's using the smoke to visualize. So here's a picture. Still. Using the smoke to, yeah, we still do this today, right? Still using the smoke to show how, you know, the, the, the set pattern of wind gets disturbed as it goes across an object and creates these different eddies and currents here. And so here's an image of, uh, down below here of him putting a lot of different devices to the test. This is my favorite image. I'm going to end on this because it reminds me of the one we started with, the graphite bars. You know, it's just kind of a visually arresting image. Here's one of what a triangle looks like when, again, these are lines of wind being moved with smoke on them so that you're able to see the patterns. But this idea, again, of using kind of really creative visual techniques to kind of make visible what normally is hidden in the world and to understand it. And when you read, like I said, the letters and diaries of scientists, they often talk a lot too about the beauty of it. What, the startlingness of discovering, to be able to see what no one had seen before, and then also to usually see the patterns in nature um, that are kind of surprising and startling. And then we could even talk more about how this is often used to generate new kinds of art. There's usually different artistic schools that take the different um, insights or who see these images and it makes them think about how they want to represent the world in different ways um, as well. So, um, so I thought, they, you know, I'm ending actually quite early here, but th th I think this is a good thing, so we have more time for questions. I know it's the last time people had um, lots of questions, so, so I'll stop here. And uh, anyone have questions? Yeah. The picture of filings that you had mm -hmm. when they were uh, was square, if you turned it upside down, would they all go up to it? Okay, so the question is, you're not supposed to ask me about actual science. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes. if, if we, so the question is, if we go back to the, the original first slide um, here. Let me see. Um, as we go there. So, oh, this, oh, this one. Okay. So if we flipped this magnet upside down, what would happen mm -hmm. to the... I would think they'd all go to it. That's what I was wondering. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to plead ignorance on it. Does anyone know? Yeah. So the question is, if we flip this magnet upside down, would they all attract to it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There be, okay, so yes. Yeah. It'll all go to it? It'll all go to it. Yeah. So I clearly need to play with the magnet more. I, I don't remember. I remember as a, as a kid, and I took my daughter to the London Science Museum, and they have a room for children that is very much in kind of keeping with today's lecture, which is making science visual and engaging to children. So it's all different experiments, things that they can play with in which they can see the forces of nature. And so I remember, but unfortunately all the kids edged me out. So, but they were all playing with them, flipping the bars upside down and doing different things. So I, but I couldn't remember, but yeah, so I guess it would come together.
Yeah. yeah. A quick story. There's a, a woman I know who's an Olympic swimmer who missed the Olympic Cup by a hundredth of a second and was terrifically disappointed, obviously. Decided she was going to continue. She trained at Arizona and in a, one of those endless pools, they studied her stroke and the eddies oh, right. that come from all of your motions, your kick and your pull and all that. And she made, not only made the next Olympic team, she won a gold medal. Oh, oh, wow. Yes, did everyone hear that? The story about an Olympic medalist who, or an Olympian who, was it for qualifying or for the actual? She missed it. She, Okay, so she missed her qualifying um, score by like time by one one hundredth of a second, or this tiny fractional amount. And then she went and worked with people. And this is true with a lot of Olympic sports, whether it's ski jumping, swimming, where they put them in pools or in wind tunnels or different things, and they're studying the patterns, like we saw the airflow, and asking them to think about exactly how they form their stroke or how they lean forward if they're a ski jumper or a skater, like to aerodynamically how to get that edge to have that extra. And then she ended up winning a gold medal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, there you go. Yes, exactly. No, science is used a lot in sports and, then, and then a lot of these kind of visual. And automobiles. Too. And automobiles, that's right. Yeah, auto racing, things like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Jet airplane. Jet airplane. Yeah, exactly. So they start understanding like why wings potentially can have lift and all these different. Ends of the wings up now. Right. Stable. Right. Yeah, so if you fly on more modern jets, you'll notice the tips of the wings, instead of being kind of points, they're usually turned upward for stability, yeah. So again, these wind tunnel tests, they're kind of doing things all the time to figure out. They do things too with wind shear, like when planes get hit by, when the wind shifts direction dramatically, it's very troubling for pilots of landing. Uh, no one has to fly soon, right? I don't want to talk about these things, but, no, they, but they've redesigned planes for that reason. So not only is it about making the plane as fast or as efficient as possible, but also as stable as possible in different conditions. So they'll create wind tunnels where they'll just throw gusts of air with smoke trails and things like that um, to be able to do that, yeah? Yeah, I always want to get on those planes. They, they have winglets, and they're retrofitting a lot of planes with them because in addition to stabilization, somehow it increases fuel uh, consumption. Okay. And I figure that I ought to get an extra piece of luggage on $25. Right. I think you should push for that. I'm going to on that. I've got a petition. That's right. Uh, I restate that uh, for the camera. Uh, the, the, the comment was that these planes with the wing lights also take up more fuel. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. That's right. That's right. Sorry. Use less fuel, um, and so therefore, shouldn't we all get, or especially you, should get a piece of extra luggage to carry? <laughs> I think that seems reasonable. The usefulness of science—it's going to get you extra baggage. Can you talk a little bit about when visualization causes it to come to a wrong conclusion, and how difficult that is in your career? So the question is, can I talk about how visualization can lead to wrong conclusions? Examples. How difficult it would be to correct it later. And how difficult it would be to correct it later. Um, well, so we certainly saw some examples in the debate about cholera of different people who had compelling, sometimes the best graphics. And I should point out that while Snow was very effective in getting people to shut down the pump, that particular pump on Broad Street, it was largely ignored by the medical community. And not because they were ignoramuses or things like that, but because they were more, they found the other graphs and maps more compelling about altitude, about miasma. And again, he didn't have a theory to really explain disease. So there's a sense in which you could say that like, that's a good example of the power of visual evidence to lead people down paths that were not fruitful here. I think it's something to think about more. I mean, it, it is a good question. I, historians of science, we tend to be sometimes what we'll call Whiggish, which is a term. Um, Whig history is history written from the perspective of winners. I and mean, when you focus on the development of the dominant ideas and you just kind of ignore dead ends. And it was named after the Whigs of England who wrote history as the progress of liberty and of themselves. All, all history was coming towards the Whigs. And so and historians of science tend to be that way. And so I tend to focus a lot on the successful examples rather than the dominant ones. But it's something to think about because today, data analysis is kind of one of the biggest things that everyone's excited about, especially visual data analysis. You see nowadays, you know, all these charts and graphs and all kinds of efforts to tease out correlation between 
human factors and diseases or between you know, social policy and outcomes and all these things based on these kinds of graphic techniques. Um, and some of them I see that I don't, not persuaded by them, but I imagine other people might. So I, I think it's definitely a very pressing question to think about, which is in what ways visual data can be um, misleading and hard to correct. My asthma still stays with us with the name of malaria. <laughs> okay. My asthma still stays with us with the name of malaria. No, there are many ways in which, yeah, airborne diseases and other types of uh, things are, are still a part of us. Yeah, my asthma. And most people actually think, they've done surveys in different parts of the world. Most people, if you ask them to describe the etiology of diseases and things, it's more closely aligned to my asthma than it is sometimes to germ theory. Can you say a little more about the introduction of Fourier analysis? How did that, when did that first begin to be important? The Foyer analysis? Yeah, so Foyer develops these ideas in the 1820s. And again, like this gets beyond my competency in my ass. Her basic idea of being able to subject seemingly irregular curves created by nature to harmonic Foyer analysis. So that's in the 1820s. And Foyer is um, in Berlin in the 1820s and 30s. And he's participating with Hemholtz. Um, with Ludwig, all of these members of this members of the Berlin Physical Society, and they have this passion for <clears throat> understanding engines, music, um, and Fourierism as a kind of mathematical tool. So I think there's a good argument to be made that that's why Germany and the continent and those physicists kind of jump into all these new fields. That they're just in a dynamic moment where, between Fourier and between all these engineers with their diagrams, they start thinking about the application. So 1820s it starts off and it gets applied up until about the 18. 40s and 50s, so. Yeah. When was the germ theory accepted? Is that Leeuwenhoek, or was that, I mean, was it because you could see them with a microscope, or was it before that? So the question is, when was germ theory <coughs> accepted? Was it accepted with Leeuwenhoek, who was a Dutch microscopist, uh, a contemporary of Hoek? Um, actually, a little bit more talented than Hoek, even in terms of his perception, not as good at communicating it graphically to audiences. He never was, uh, never created kind of books like Micrographia. Uh, but it was not with Leeuwenhoek in that early period. The germ theory, there were people that anticipated it and had ideas about it, but in terms of the full developed theory that was persuadable and uh, persuaded people, uh, waited for Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, the French scientist of the 19th century. So it's in the late 1860s. 1860s? Yeah. Um, and what he does there is a series of, I don't know if you'd call it visual or not, but it, it is making the invisible visible. He, in his laboratory in Paris, he develops these beautiful swan neck um, kind of um, vials and uh, glass items. And he's able to develop pure cultures of different strands of like anthrax. And he's able to develop ways of identifying and isolating particular strains of bacteria and then growing them, fermenting them like in a petri dish. He's also able to create particular fluids like beer is one example, which never rock, where he's able to pasteurize. He's able to heat them over certain degrees and kill bacteria. He's also able to create a, a thing of water in one of these swan neck vials, which for 12 years refuses to grow any mold, any bacteria, anything. He's able to create a completely sanitary environment. And the I, what he's doing there is proving this idea that um, spontaneous generation, which is at the heart of a lot of these theories, that mold, that people don't know where they come from. They think they just generate new matter. Like all matter has the quality of putrefying. He's able to show that, no, I can hold a nice vial of water with some sugar in it, which would be good for things to grow, yeast bacteria. I can have it sit there for 12 years without anything growing up. And so that was, a, uh, in some ways, that's an impressive visual testimony. And he does it by creating a piece of asbestos that he shoves into this elaborate swan neck. So air is allowed to come freely into the vessel, but it has to go through a series of swan loops, which would trap any dust. And he's arguing that dust is what's carrying bacteria and germs. So he's basically able to say, I can give you a vial of water that's been in there for 12 years, and that it has not one piece of bacteria, mold, fungus, and whatnot. Um, the asbestos he lights with fire to make sure that his hand hasn't contaminated it here. And then he puts it in the jar. So it's a very impressive, and Pasteur is one of the great popular writers of science, too. He is a very good communicator and effective. Um, persuader. He does use all these images to show people his you know, swan neck and um, things like that. So, so yeah. So the 18. So it's not too long after those cholera debates. Yes, yeah, in the 1860s. I see. Yes. Uh, data visualization is is a hot topic these days uh, in business and education. And 
there is a, a, a European scientist uh, who's used that to depict some really interesting learnings with respect to population health and economies by the name, his name is Hans Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G. Okay. And for those who like to look up things on the internet, his data visualizations are are very interesting and give you a whole sense of what visualiz visualization can bring to the party. Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat that in case you haven't been hearing. So recommending a website um, or to look up online, Hans Rosling. R-O-S-L-I-N-G. R-O-S-L-I-N-G, who is a specialist of specialist data, data visualization. Yeah, a number of TED Talks are particularly interesting too. Yeah, so if you, if you go look online, you'll probably find TED Talks or different websites. This, this is the, the cutting edge of where science and the social sciences and policy are kind of colliding, or coming together a lot now, which is this idea of data visualization. Some of you might have heard of what's called GIS, Geographic Information Systems. It's basically software that allows you to put multiple maps together and put data on that. So this is what they're using now for deciding what kind of voting districts should be decided. School districts that want to know what would the population be. You know, how should you design school districts. Um, the, each of these counties here in Iowa have their own GIS database that allow you to look at like flat maps and soil maps and things like that. They, they've been woven into whether you, you know, might have never had a need to look at them, but that technique is very popular. It goes back to the 19th century of developing chloroplast maps basically plastic maps where you can layer one layer on the other and kind of look at what pattern. They didn't talk about that per se, but that was another technique used. But now it's just so powerful with computers and data. So yeah, if you have some free time, I definitely recommend looking at Hans Rosling or other sites, you know, type in data visualization, things like that. You'll find an incredible world out there. What happens post-Dowen uh, that it falls into these kinds of categories like the four that you've given us? Okay, so what happens after Darwin, after the 1860s where I took it up? Where, where would we uh, take the story of science in? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I have been thinking about that because I, I teach, this is my area of specialty is the 18th and 19th century. Um, and even there I strain because I'm talking about lots of topics of which you know, I struggle because they're very complex even. So then I start to think about what's it going to be like to teach the history of science in the 19th and 20th century. It's a little daunting um, here. So, what are some of the, I don't think I would organize maybe the class the same way. I think I might organize the class more either thematically or geogra geographically. I might be interested in the relationship of science um, to globalization, to imperialism, to decolonization, some of these things, um, which I guess is a way to duck your question. Uh, I know, I was um, yeah, so th these techniques do continue on, but there are definitely newer ones. Used. And there's interesting things about like professionalization and the government gets involved in funding research universities. So there's just so many interesting things that go on in terms of the social aspect of science. But those of you that I'm keep leaning on everyone here, but this is supposed to be a discussion. Anyone have any ideas about it? I know a lot of you, some of you were practicing scientists or well, one of the thoughts yeah. that I had as I asked the question was where we've all lived through the, the introduction of nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Uh, and destruction. I mean, it goes both ways. But that, that took, takes us scientifically into a whole other realm than was ever even thought about by our predecessors. Yeah, I think to build on that, I think that the, I stopped the class usually in the 1870s because there's a series of changes um, the rise of the kind of the eclipse of classical physics and the rise of nuclear physics. Um, all of these things uh, that um, Theoretically, you're in a different world in 1920, very different than the world of these individuals in the 1860s oh, and 70s. I think methodologically, there hasn't been as many stunning changes. I think some of the techniques I'm talking about are still used, but it's more the changes of ideas than the development. So that, yeah, I definitely agree with that point um, as well. Nuclear physics, different paradigms in evolution and the rise of genetics, and genetic evolution. So in terms of ideas, science explodes and goes in very different directions after, say, 1870. <coughs> And also, like I said, socially, where science is created in terms of university funding and other things like that. But I had to think about whether or not, and again, I, I just don't think that the way I organize it now, I'm not sure that would apply as well to the later period. It's something I'll have to think about. I would like to teach a class at Grinnell that carries it up into the 20th century. Because the story of science is so important to understanding the 20th century and modern, modern life. So, um, yeah. Another area is space. 
we send things up and we get pictures and you get it's totally different than it was. So you know, the comment is about another difference is uh, space. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm running um, past our time. I forgot we're ending early today. But yeah, space is another great example of where images, the image from 1968, many of you might remember being back, Earth rising, or later ones. Um, uh, it changed, I, I would imagine it changed the way you view the world to see it photographically. Well, thank you. Of course, have a card for you. <laughs> a wonderful course. You made it live. You made it so exciting. Not just facts and dates. Oh boy. <laughs> wonderful. We enjoyed it immensely. Oh, I have a little cartoon. Oh, look at that. There's Charlie Darwin. He's an ape. <laughs> and there's Isaac. He's a dressed up dude from that era. <laughs> Dangling an apple in front of. Charlie. <laughs> so, great minds we have met. Newton and Darwin are names we know. We all met these guys long ago. Their feats of clever observation we do admire. No reservation. However, there are many more who did great stuff in days of yore that you revealed by show and tell. And now we think we know them well. You showed us all those leaps in science and scientists who showed defiance when their ideas were met with laughter, but whose ideas live ever after. <laughs> we now know there were many more great minds with truths unknown before that left us with way more to grapple than hairy apes and a falling apple. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, for those of you who have uh, signed your, uh, I'm sorry, who have filled out the uh, uh, evaluation, thank you, that was, <laughs> now the names of the first to go, <laughs> who have filled out your evaluation, you can either leave them on the table or put them on the table in the hall. Uh, next week, uh, Professor Dan Kaiser will be here to talk about B.J. Ricker uh, and the rise and fall of Grinnell Giant. Uh, there is no registration, no tuition. Uh, come early to get a good seat. Uh, we do ask that you register when you come in so that we have a count for the day. And two weeks from today is Dr. J.R. Paulson and his, uh, his course, which he talked to you about this morning. So go out and enjoy this lovely afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you all again next week. <laughs>